Hello and welcome to episode 344 of the official EstablishedRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. As always, joined by Evan Silva, we are here to take a look back at the 2021 season, go over some hits, go over some misses. Hopefully you listened to the previous episode, which was early rounds. This will be later rounds. Evan, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think the first one went pretty well. Check out the uh, the early round hits and misses, and I think this is going to be a good one too. I'm, I'm excited for this one. All right. As Evan said on today's show, we are going to review some of the biggest hits and misses. I think the idea here, as I said in the previous episode, is to try to learn something, you know, be better in the future, not just go, oh, in hindsight analysis, this was easy. Well, what can we learn that we actually didn't know at the time? Last episode, again, we looked at the early rounds. Today, we'll be looking at the later rounds. This show is indeed brought to you by the Established Run NBA product. All-Star break returns Thursday, DFS, props. It's all happening. Head to the NBA subscribe page for details there. All right, let's get into it here, Evan, with some later round stuff. Uh, Let's start on a, a good note this time. A good note was Josh Allen was Silva's quarterback one this year and you know not he not a, you know a, a tier ahead or anything but Josh Allen was the QB1 for us ahead of Mahomes Lamar Kyler Josh Allen finishes the year as the QB1 I think you know at the quarterback position obviously results are going to clump closer together than other positions but man Josh Allen can really separate when he has big games and he certainly had some of them this year take the people back to why you had Josh Allen Number one, Silva, anything we can take away from that going forward? Yeah, you're right. If I recall correctly, um, I, I think I had him and Mahomes and Lamar like literally all next to each yep, other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even Kyler was at the bottom of that. Dak a little bit down further. But yeah, Josh Allen wound up settling. Started the offseason with Lamar as the one. And then I think I pivoted to Mahomes for a minute, but then just settled on Josh Allen. The one thing that's great about Josh Allen is that he's still good in fantasy, even when he doesn't play well in the games, because he scores in so many different ways. Um, he got better as the season progressed. You remember early in the year, people were talking about, oh, the Josh Allen regression, you know, here it comes. No, man, he, he kept getting better as the year progressed, and you didn't hear those people squawking uh, by the end of the year. You know, and he he had such a fun season. The progression was great. You know, they um they went through, you know, it was kind of like in real life, it was a little bit up and down. You remember Brian Dable was getting a lot of criticism for not running the ball enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and people were saying that he was overrated. He winds up getting a, a head coaching job. We'll have to see how that goes going forward. I I, I fully expect them to maintain, you know, the the probably the exact same system because Josh Allen has gotten so comfortable in it, but yeah, the way that they play offensively and then the way that he plays as a dynamic dual threat. And Stefan Diggs didn't even have the season, you know, not remotely the season that he had in 2020. And Josh Allen was still the overall quarterback one. Getting dudes involved like Dawson Knox, Isaiah McKenzie, when he steps in, you know, Cole Beasley, when he, when he uh, was healthy, he was productive. Diggs still had a good year. It's just everybody got spoiled by 2020. Um, but – yeah, we, we, we nailed this one. So I think one thing that we can take away on the Josh Allen stuff is if you look back, what the Bills have done, they're capable of literally not even handing the ball to their running back. Like they like, and there was times in 2020 where they had like two running back runs. And anytime you have that upside for your quarterback who accounts already for like 80% of your team's touchdowns, you know, I mean, it's just like, man, dude is like the dream for yeah. fantasy. And I mean, and, and I think his arrow is still pointing up. You know, he's, you know, we talk about this a lot. What is the, the number one mark of elite quarterback play, elevating teammates. I think he's making the guys around him better. Yeah. Yeah. Let's stick at the quarterback position. And I know on the previous episode, I, you know, Jonathan Taylor was a horrific miss for sure. I actually think that my biggest regret is all the Josh field, uh, Justin Fields and Trey Lance stuff, because man, like in best ball, I was taking so much fields and Lance with the assumption. And maybe it was a dumb assumption because it was a bit of a parlay. They had to get the starting job and they had to play well. Meanwhile, for just like a couple rounds earlier, I wasn't hardly taking any Aaron Rodgers. I wasn't hardly taking any 
Tom Brady. And I know people, you know, have me as an ageist or whatever, you know, and that's fair. I think in the quarterback position, I'm not really an ageist. What I do try to find though is quarterbacks who can run in the later rounds. And obviously you don't get that from Brady and Rodgers. But man, like this was really bad, Evan. Again, this I think this is my biggest regret of the entire season. Fields and Lance being in on them and being out yeah. on Brady and Rodgers. So could we have avoided this? What do you think about how we handled kind of that back end of quarterback? Yeah, it's it's the tough. I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo had a really nice season, you know, and for most of the season, he had Debo, Ayuk, and Kittle healthy for most of the season. I know that Ayuk, you know, started out in the doghouse and Debo got a little banged up and Kittle got a little banged up. But for most of the season, those guys were in there. And it's tough to fail in a Kyle Shanahan offense when you have those three dudes, a pretty good offensive line. You know, Trey Lance, they showed a a minimal amount of trust in him early in the season. He had a really nice start later in the year against the Cardinals when Jimmy G was dealing with an injury. He got better as the game progressed. The assumption seems to be that he's going to be, you know, the the locked-in starter for 2022. But, man, they really showed – even in that game, they didn't show a whole lot of trust in in Trey Lance. And, look, he was was very raw coming out of North Dakota State. I mean, I think he had, what, like 350 career dropbacks in his college career. Um, And so that – we definitely took a leap there. We, we took a leap of faith there, and it did not pay off. Justin Fields, the design of the offense was just so bad. You know, it was like an, it was an Andy Dalton offense, and the offensive line was horrific. And, you know, Allen Robinson, what a, what a weird year he had. You know, he no-showed the season. Um, I do think Justin Fields got better as the year progressed. You know, he just playing more. Definitely. but. Yeah, and I mean, he he had some good um, – he had a, a couple of good fantasy games late in the year, but – Well, I'll say this. The situation, takeaway, the environment was really bad yeah. for Justin Fields, and I and I think that I, I didn't build that into – and we were checking these guys, you know, in embarrassing, like, eighth round. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I think one thing I can take away is that one of the things I kept going back to was first-round quarterbacks over the last decade or so – when you get taken in the first round, you play, period. And like, it didn't even like cross my mind that Trey Lance would never play the whole year. I know he played when Jimmy G got hurt. And it didn't cross my mind that Andy Dalton would be like the preferred starter for Matt Nagy. You know what I mean? Like, it didn't even cross my mind. I thought those guys would win jobs. In hindsight, though, you know, it's such a small sample on these first round quarterbacks, you know, and we need to leave open the possibility that, yeah, maybe Trey Lance will sit for the entire year. Maybe Justin Fields will sit for the first seven games. And if they do, and then they're also just mediocre when they get in, like Fields was or bad like Fields was, it's, it's a real, real, real problem. So, yeah, and we also knew San Francisco's early schedule was soft, and we thought they could start, you know, 4-0 and or 5-1, and and they did, and then how can they move away from Jimmy G at that point? They get momentum, you know? So, yeah, I, I just think this was a, a, our worst of the year. Like, worse, way worse than Jonathan Taylor. This was, this was just bad, 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 <laughs> yeah, it, bad. It was bad. It was. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. And it was compounded Sorry, by – it was compounded by, you know, I didn't take any Rodgers or Brady. And so it was just, it was compounding. But, you know, it, in it, my best, best ball teams, I just like took Josh Allen and like didn't take another quarterback until Derek Carr or something like that, you know, and those were the best ones, just avoiding that whole group altogether. Mm-hmm. There was a quarterback we were on though, Evan, that I want to get to as a hit, Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts' ADP really sunk. I mean, we took Jalen Hurts in the 12th round of our FFPC main. I couldn't believe he was still there. I mean, it's just insane for someone with his rushing ability. Jalen Hurts finishes as the QB9, you know, I mean, he ran for 784 yards and 10 touchdowns. Like what we hoped Trey Lance and Justin Fields would be, Jalen Hurts was, and he was available in the 12th round. He wasn't a shiny new object like the rookies, but man, Jalen Hurts is, is, I mean, just so good rushing. It's really hard to fail when you're a quarterback that can run like Jalen Hurts can. So I was happy that we were on Jalen Hurts. I hope a lot of people got him in like rounds 10, 11, 12, and it worked out. What do you think about how we handled Jalen Hurts? Uh, I mean, we, we, we killed this one. You know, this, 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 this was a happy time draft pick. And I, I got him on, I got him on a ton of teams too. You know, he's another player that doesn't have to play well in real life to produce in fantasy. I mean, he had some monster garbage time games, but yeah. we knew all those, all that was a possibility with him. Yeah. You know, that's built into his outlook, built into his projection. People are getting pit. I think I, I tweeted at one point, Jalen Hurts is just like the cheat code. You know, he's the, the classic cheat code. 
quarterback and people like got pissed like dude sucks yeah. you know and like and, and then people were saying oh we got to change fantasy football so that we don't um highlight the rushing stats of quarterbacks as much so that guys like Jalen Hurts aren't you know killing it in fantasy which he was you mentioned he finished the quarterback nine he was consistent week to week he became a little bit less consistent late but man week to week he was giving you 17 points you know, at least somewhere between 17 and like 35, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for the, the bulk of the year, we don't need to change fantasy scoring. What you need to do, <laughs> you need to look at the scoring settings and then adjust your fantasy draft plan according to that so that you can win the game. You know, it's a game. It's uh, a game. And, and you have to be aware of the scoring. You don't change the scoring so that, you know, to, to, to fit your little narrative. 12th round quarterback who can run for a thousand yards or run for a hundred yards in a game. Like that's an auto pick every time yep. period. So I was happy with that. I know, I know I'm interrupting the video. Wah. But if you're enjoying this video and want to see more fantasy football and DFS content like it, please just take two seconds, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button really does go a long way for us. And we'd appreciate it. Thank you for watching. And now, Back to the show. Uh, one other just general hit I wanted to have was avoiding dead zone running backs. And again, like DeAndre Swift was taken in the dead zone, but he doesn't profile one. The guys who profile dead zone running backs are like guys who just aren't that good, who the only reason that you rely on them, it's not for explosive ability. It's not for pass catch. It's not for any other reason than they're going to get volume or you think you're going to get volume. And that to me, like the examples of that were Miles Gaskin, uh, Mike Davis, Josh Jacobs. And like, I was taking just absolutely none of those guys whatsoever and that's like the definition of dead zone in other words people are like oh mike davis gonna get 300 touches how can he be bad you know miles gaskin's gonna get 250 touches how can he be bad well maybe their job isn't that secure maybe they're not that explosive at all they don't make any big plays they're not that great in the pass game and so like avoiding those kind of running backs in the middle rounds is what dead zone is all about we'll talk a ton more about that once we start flipping the page to 2022 but yeah i just thought that that was uh, a good result there for avoiding those guys and we had under bets on like all these guys yeah uh, in season long props because their rushing yardage was like 800 or or 850 or whatever i mean these guys are just like so thin to get there on that any thoughts on the dead zone running backs um i got a little too much mike davis in the sixth round oh no yeah i mean but uh i, I didn't take any of these other guys gaskin jacobs no yeah um okay <laughs> A miss was Leonard Fournette. And we have a very checkered history with Leonard Fournette. Like, dude was almost out of the league. Like, legit almost out of the league. And, you know, my thought before the year was uh, Ronald Jones was going to play. Gio Bernard was going to play on pass downs. And Leonard Fournette just isn't that good. But, man, credit to Uncle Lenny. I mean, he iced Ronald Jones, which I know isn't saying much. Ronald Jones isn't very good. But then he, most importantly, he iced Gio on pass downs. I mean, Leonard Fournette was playing on clear pass downs, he only got 12.8 carries per game this year, but six targets per game. And, you know, a lot of this goes back to Tom Brady. And, and, you know, I've talked about this so much, how Tom Brady's throw rate at running back is so, so, so high. I just thought that those passes would go to Gio or at least split between Gio and Lenny. For Lenny to get six targets per game, I was just dead wrong. And so I I don't know, man, like we have such a checkered history with Leonard Fournette, but yeah, I give him credit. He played well this year and he was an awesome fantasy asset when he was healthy. Is, is this a miss just because he outscored our expectation or is this a miss uh, relative to ADP? Because I thought we were uh, in, in on him relative to ADP. I mean, I, I was getting him. I, I got him in pros versus Joe's. I got okay. him in season long. I, mean, I did it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, he certainly vastly outproduced our projection for him. Yeah. But I, I don't think that anybody was, was particularly high on him entering this season. No, definitely not. I mean, he was going in like the 10th, 11th round or so. And I think, you know, one thing that like, once you get out of that dead zone, it's like ambiguous backfields on good teams. And I think that's something we can take away. Are you on a good team? And is the backfield ambiguous? In other words, somebody on the Bucks is going to have a good year at running back. Who's it going to be? We don't really know. Let's take some shots. And I think that is something we can take away going forward. Speaking of ambiguous backfields, we had a hit on James Conner. I, you know, Good offense in the Cardinals, ambiguous backfield. A lot of people were really high on Chase Edmonds. I was high on Chase Edmonds to some degree, but yeah, I thought James Conner in like the 10th or 11th made a lot of sense. He was always going to get the goal line work and he was going to get a share of base. 
obviously I didn't think he'd score 18 touchdowns in 15 games, just totally ridiculous. But again, just to hammer home the point, ambiguous backfields on good offenses are typically going to be good picks when they go in the 10th, 11th, 12th. <clears throat> like these guys were going any James Connor hindsight takes Evan. You were really high. If I, uh, yeah, really high on James Connor. Yeah. Um, if I recall correctly. And that was a big hit. I mean, he looked great for the vast majority of the season. The injury stuff popped up at the end. Um, but he, he looked poor the year before in Pittsburgh. He didn't get a very good contract. I think it was under $2 million, uh, for one year. But he crushed it when he was healthy. He looked fantastic. He was a really good fit in the offense. He was highly effective in scoring position. He was good in the pass game. He had an excellent season. You, that, was, that was a great call by you. All right, let's stick with the same team and a bad call. I mean, I think I took Rondell Moore on, I don't know, 80% of my teams. I mean, I, I took so much Rondell. I just thought he's going to play the Larry Fitzgerald role and he'd have one of the best yaks in the league. And I thought that, you know, Cliff would find a way to use him in the way that fits his skill set. I mean, Jesus, man, 1.3 dot average depth of target, 1.3 yards. I mean, it's so far the lowest in the league. The second lowest in the league was 4.9 yards, Braxton Barrios. 1.3 yards is the lowest ever, ever for a wide receiver since PFF began tracking this in 2008. And when you catch the ball behind the line of scrimmage, at the line of scrimmage, one yard from the line of scrimmage, it is so hard to rack up fantasy stats. You know, and he only finished with 3.8 catches per game, 8.1 yards per catch. I mean, literally unusable. And so this was a really, really bad miss. And it's not as painful because it was so late. You know, I was taking him in, you know, 11th, 12th, 13th round. But man, it, he was just egregious. And so ah, maybe like I should have diversified off Rondell Moore in that flyer range more. And maybe I should have considered that like his profile was not that, that, that great. But I don't know, man. What do you think about how Rondell Moore played it out? Yeah, it was just kind of disappointing because – he just kind of, you know, we knew going into the season he was the number four in the Cardinals. You know, they they play a lot of four receiver sets, but he was the number four. Mm -hmm. And his role never really, you know, spiked. You know, guys would even go out and he wouldn't necessarily jump into, you know, a much bigger role. Yeah, he couldn't play any other role besides like, like that. Or Cliff didn't give him a chance to play any other role. Yeah. And he wound up just getting caught in the – uh caught up in the horizontal raid. I, I think he should be a running back. I think he should be right. Austin Eckler. And, um, but you know, they had their version of Austin Eckler and Chase Edmonds. So he was never going to get that opportunity. I, I, I think that that's how he would be best deployed, but I don't know. I, he's going to be an interesting guy to analyze entering 2022. It's, I'm going to be sad if he turns into like Tavon Austin or something, because I do think yeah. Rondell Moore can play. He just Me needs too. like to be better uh, schemed. Okay. This was one that I, I mean, Maybe we should know by now. Trey Sermon was a miss. I, I was on Trey Sermon. I know you were on Raheem Mostert and you got unlucky there with the injury to Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert actually probably would have had a huge year. But anyways, Trey Sermon did not. And I guess what we can take from this is that Kyle Shanahan, again, proving that when he trades up for a guy in the draft, it is absolutely meaningless. I mean, he traded up for Trey Lance. You know, they benched uh, Ayuk for a while. You remember Dante Pettis. I think there was a running yeah. back like Joe Williams. Joe or something Williams, like that. Yep, yeah, from Utah. So it means nothing. And so like this rhetoric they, they that, oh, traded up for him after he retired. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean I, and for me to get fall for this again, I fell for it again. I, I said, uh, Kyle Shannon traded up to get Trey Sermon. It's got to be, he, he's got to get a share of it, a good share of it with Raheem Mostert. And he was inactive. He was a healthy scratch in week one. And he played behind like, I mean, not only does he play behind Eli Mitchell, but he played behind Jeff Wilson, uh, Jermichael Hasty. When Eli Mitchell got hurt, they were like, we'd rather use Debo at running back than go to Trey Sermon. So, you know. This was just an absolute disaster. The good news is it was easy to cut bait early because he was literally a healthy scratch in week yeah. one. But man, this was a disaster. And I, I, you know, I'm never buying this Kyle Shannon traded up for him crap again. Uh, so at least I learned something. Yeah. And then when, when he got in uh, to the games, like Trey Sermon did not look good, man. He, he was yeah. slow. He, he, he moves like a fullback. You know, D Daigle didn't like him coming out of college. Matt Waldman has had him as his number one running back in right. the class. Right. You know, it, this stuff is hard. Like, it, okay. it's, it's not easy. This was a, a brutal whiff uh, by me um, because I, I liked him. I, I liked him as, you know, a seventh, eighth round pick. I yeah. think people, people really got into him, though, and they started taking him even early, earlier than that. Yeah. Uh, but I, 
I, I thought he was an, you know, like the ultimate eighth round pick to me. You know, I, I love taking him in the eighth round um, because he had an opportunity to be the lead. It looked like he, he had an opportunity to be the lead back in San Francisco. You remember, it was him and Mostert. The yeah. B riders were, you know, throughout OTAs, early training camp. It was him and Mostert. And then like two weeks before the season, crickets. And then we come out of week one, he's a healthy scratch. I mean, you, you remember that was a, a wild oh, yeah. turn of events. And then what was happening with IU, this team winds up, you know, going to the what NFC championship game. But, man, they, they, there was some weird stuff going on in 49ers camp, uh, late in camp. Yeah. I mean, draft capital means a ton to most coaches. To Kyle Shanahan, it does not. You know, and I think that's just a good thing to remember. But also, I just I think that Sermon just might not be good, though. I mean, okay. I, I hear you, but slow. clearly the 49ers did work and thought he was good enough for them to trade yeah. up for it, you know, but it just yeah. doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. A hit was Michael Pittman. You had Michael Pittman 81st overall in the top 150. His ADP was 102nd. Michael Pittman finishes 88, 10, 82, 6. He didn't like blow the doors off, but considering the offensive environment, it was very run heavy. Carson Wentz, I think, is like a sub average quarterback right now at best to finish with 88 catches for 1,000 yards, six touchdowns. Really nice season from. Michael Pittman, you know, uh, in hindsight, number one receiver, people were talking about T.Y. Hilton. No, 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 no. He's done. It was always Michael Pittman. And so I think being on that made a big difference. Any Michael Pittman thoughts? Yeah, and there are there are many analytical reasons to like Michael Pittman, but I think that the, the football guy analysis kind of hit here because Michael Pittman is not a huge separation receiver. He's good after the catch. You know, he can win contested. He can win. Uh, you know, in, in tight spaces, but you know, Car and but Carson Wentz is willing to throw the football to receivers that are not open. You know, a lot of a lot of quarterbacks like to see the receiver come open. Carson Wentz, he's not very good, but he does do one thing well, and that's deliver the ball to guys that are covered or, or you know have defenders in their vicinity. And Michael Pittman can make plays on those balls, so. Yeah. I think that the football guy analysis really helped here, uh, but there are a lot of analytical reasons to like him. Uh, there were, and there still are because he's a young dude who, you know, was very productive in college. He's got, he's got good measurables. Um, and I, I think he's, he's looking at a bright career. Uh, a receiver that I was taking ahead of Michael Pittman regretfully was Jerry Judy. And, and this was a miss. And I know he got hurt in week one, but even when Jerry Judy came back, he only averaged 3.5 catches per game over the final nine when he came back. I think in hindsight, not thinking enough about how Denver was going to play. I mean, this was like a total boomer coaching staff who was going to try to establish it so hard. Can an offense with Teddy Bridgewater quarterback really support Judy, Sutton, Tim Patrick, Fant, KJ Hamler was healthy at the time, Albert O, uh, you know, it's just really hard to think in hindsight, obviously, that they can support all those guys. I just thought Jerry Judy's talent, health would separate him from the pack. It didn't happen. And this was a miss. Any Jerry Judy thoughts? Yeah. And as you mentioned, there were a variety of reasons that Jerry Judy missed in 2021. I still think he's an awesome dynasty buy, but it happens every year, man. The damn high ankle sprains. Like, there, that's a horrible injury for a receiver. He had it, like, in week one, right? Wasn't week it week one. one? Yep, he went down. A week. He was having a good game in week one, too, and he went down. Uh, yeah, he was, man. It's just it, – it will ruin your season, and, yeah. and, and that's what happened here. And, of course, as you mentioned, look, they had two good backs. They had a pretty good offensive line. They were going to establish it. Vic Fangio is their head coach. Um, you know, so the, the opportunity just wasn't there in terms of pass volume. Late in the year, the, the the pass efficiency wasn't there either to, you know, compensate for that. Um, and there were a lot of a lot of mouths to feed. And you know, even when he came back, I don't. I I always feel like the dudes that come back from the high ankle sprains, they they're never truly healthy until the next season. Um, by the way, our 2022 best ball rankings are up for free on the site for now uh, for the guys who want to check that out. And it's really hard to do Broncos projections or rankings because we don't know who the quarterback's going to be. If it's Aaron Rodgers, like obviously Jerry Judy and Sutton are going to be like, you know, third, fourth round picks or whatever. Right now, it's, we're trying to mitigate that a little bit. You can check out those on the site. Last two I want to hit here, uh, LaVisca Chenault. I mean, if you told me that Charlie Lawrence is going to throw it 602 times, seventh most in the league, Travis Etienne and DJ Chark were going to get hurt. The Jaguars are going to be terrible. They're going to be in pass-friendly game scripts. And LaVisca Chenault was going to be like unusable all year. I mean, 619 yards and zero touchdowns. I would have thought you're insane. Maybe, Evan, 
we just need to say at this point, Liska Chenault is not good at football. Do you think that's fair? Um, and what do you think about hindsight? Because we, I, I took a bunch of Liska Chenault, you know, around eight or nine or so, something like that. Yeah. I, I'm not ready to say that because I know that he is like a, a superb athlete, uh, great with the ball in his hands. Um, I, and, and this was maybe the most poorly designed offense in the league. I mean, you had, you know, receivers running into each other on their route combinations. The offense was just absolutely dead. I think Trevor Lawrence is way better than what he showed in 2021. And you just kind of give everybody a pass. LaVisca Chanel is going to go really late in drafts this year, I think. Mm -hmm. And so he's still going to be a guy that I'm willing to take a chance on. You know, there was like a 54 yard catch and run that he had that, you know, just showed what he could do in the open field. But I mean, he, he's still raw and he's sort of, he's like a big gadget and his dot was really low. And I don't know if he can run routes outside. So it is definitely, there's definitely a concern when it comes to like his game. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, a, a smarter coach will figure out ways to use him. And hopefully Doug Peterson is that guy. Yeah. We'll have more on coaching change fallout coming up in the next month or so. Last one I wanted to hit here. And this one's on me, man. I mean, it was kind of a running bit during the off season that, uh, you know, everybody else, Evan Leone said, Sam Darnold was absolute trash. And I said, well, Sam Darnold might be trash, but when you have Joe Brady offense, DJ Moore, Christian McCaffrey, Robbie Anderson, Terrace Marshall, that it's like really hard to fail. And it turned out that Sam Darnold was pretty, pretty decent for the first, I don't know, two, three, four weeks maybe. And then he was like the worst quarterback in the NFL, like the absolute stone worst. I mean, he was so, so, so bad. And so obviously that dragged down Robbie, who we were high on regretfully. Terrace Marshall, I took a lot in the flyer range. He was like unable to be used at all. And obviously the Sam Darnold best ball stuff turned into total dust after the first month. And so this is on me. I, I, I you know, I, I gave maybe too much credit to going to Joe Brady offense than I should have hindsight on the Panthers stuff. It was a mess, Evan. Yeah. I mean, look, Sam Darnold was a top five fantasy quarterback for the first month of the season. You remember when he was getting the rushing touchdowns and then I told Greg that uh, Rosenthal that he needed to retire. I didn't really mean that, I didn't really mean that he should retire. I, I meant that he should retire from fantasy analysis, which he should. I tell him that every year. So that, that's nothing new, but I, you know, obviously wound up being wrong. If you were looking at Sam Darnold from a long-term, um, you know, investment standpoint, uh, the, he was sort of like the, um, the bridge to Trey Lance, you know, the bridge to Justin Fields yeah. and, and he, he did his job for the first month, but then if you were relying on him, anything past that, I mean, you know, you, well, you, you, you couldn't in, in any capacity. Yeah. Uh, Terrence Marshall, I thought had, a kind of worrisome rookie year. You mentioned the complete inability to, to uh, earn targets. How about like, you know, playing behind what Brandon Zilstra yeah. late in the year or, or, you know, whoever, I can't even remember who they were trotting out behind Robbie and DJ Moore. Um, DJ Moore, I think is, is still a buy, you know, he's like 25, 26 at this point. He's still really young. So good. Uh, I, yeah. So good. But he kind of went the way, you know, as you know, when Darnold was balling early on. Yeah. I mean, DJ DJ Moore was was really playing well, but then you know, everything kind of every, everything just kind of went to shit as as the year progressed. And uh, the the Panthers, you remember, I, I think they started three and zero, and Matt Rule was like the favor for coach of the year, and that was that was dead a few weeks later. Yeah, what a mess of the year for the Panthers. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this look back at the 2021 fantasy football season over the last two episodes. Really appreciate you all sticking with us here. We're going to continue with free podcasts throughout the off season. Be sure you are subscribed again. It is free anywhere you find podcasts, anywhere on YouTube. Hit subscribe on the channel. Helps us out a lot. For Evan, for Bruce Lute, I'm Adam. Good luck, everybody.